Jesus died to save the entire world. Today, he's training us in grace so that we can go out and influence someone else's life. That's why I'm so grateful for the friends and partners of this ministry who freely and cheerfully give financial offerings to support us. You understand our vision and you help us in so many ways to reach those who are searching for hope in the midst of darkness. Thank you for empowering us to expand God's kingdom worldwide. Your financial donations into this ministry work all over the world to change countless lives. If you'd like to support our efforts to save the lost, you may call in or visit CrefloDollarMinistries.org today. God bless you. This phrase came up in John chapter 1, which uh, before I wanted to go any further, I wanted to make sure I took time to explain what this means because this is pretty... It's one of those things you don't want to skip. John chapter 1, uh, verse 11 and 12. And <clears throat> verse 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, Jesus is, 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 he's referring to Jesus, how Jesus came as a Jewish man to his people, Jewish people, and they didn't, they didn't receive him. They received him not. And then verse 12 says, but even though they didn't receive him, as many as received him, as many as received him, he gave, gave he power. And, and this word is, is interesting. It means he gave them the right or the privilege. That's what it means. He gave you know, you think, well, he gave them power, and we will immediately just kind of translate that like we do everything else. But if, if, even if you have a Bible, you got those little notes in the middle of it, it it'll tell you that, that it literally means the right or the privilege. So he says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right or the privilege to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So for people who receive him, they have the right and the privilege to become the sons of God. Now, the evidence that you've received Jesus is going to be based on your dependence on him. You believe him, you receive him, you depend on him. Okay, that, that's what that's all about. It's, it's a little different than somebody marching around and saying, well, you know, I've received Jesus. Well, how do we authenticate that? Well, do you depend on him? When you depend on him, that indicates you have received him. When you've received him, that's because you believed him. All those go together. So it's a powerful thing for him to say that to everyone who will receive me and begin to live a life of dependence on me, they now have the privilege. I like that word. The right or the, you have the privilege. Uh, to me, having the privilege means you get something you don't deserve. You have the privilege to be the sons of God, uh, to become the sons of God. So tonight I want to talk to you about what that means. I want to talk to you about the supernatural power of sonship. And I found some notes that I had, I don't know how long I had these notes, but I want to read some of them to you. I want you to listen to it because it's, it's captivating. It really got my attention. <clears throat> uh, the absence <clears throat> of knowledge will produce darkness. Darkness, in other words, darkness can prevail when knowledge is absent. I just think about that with anything. When you don't have the knowledge about a thing, then darkness can prevail because you just don't know. Uh, how many times have you said as a mother or a father, I just didn't know. I, I wish I'd have known this when I was 20 or 30. The absence of knowledge allows darkness to prevail. So whatever is not working in your life is not God's fault. <clears throat> mm. Whatever's not working in your life is not God's fault. It's your knowledge that's inadequate. It's not God's fault. It's inadequate knowledge. 
uh, it's not working because of something I don't understand or something that I don't know. It's inadequate knowledge. Now you're thinking, what does this have to do with, 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 with being a son, son of God? We, we don't know about that. We read over it so quickly and, you know, just rejoice. Like, yeah, we're the, we have the privilege to become sons of God. What does that mean? And I said, I can't, I can't go talk about nothing else in the book of John until we, we got to rectify this. What does that mean to be the sons of, the son of God? So what you see of your physical self is not the real you. We've talked about that. You look in the mirror, you see your physical self. That's not the real you. It is only a covering. The real you is a what? Come on. Spirit. All right. You are. Now, now listen to these words. That's why I want to do this first before we start. You are divine in nature. Created after the very image of God. You are divine. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. You are divine in nature, created in the very image of God. Listen to this. And God said, let us make man in our what? Image. After our what? Likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, so forth and so on. Uh, that hadn't changed you still have a divine nature. You are divine in nature. So God is saying that until the truth of your divinity dawns on you, then you will walk as if you, uh, you you'll walk like a normal natural man. Somebody says, I am one. you will be subjected to the same limitation as other mortals. What are, what are you getting at? I, I, I'm, I'm about to say that you have the privilege not to be like other mortals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I thought y'all were ready for this. Now, yeah, now. Y'all trying to stay the same. Mortality is, you know, somebody that dies. Immortality is, you, 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 don't, you don't see death. But understanding your divine nature is the, way to re, is the way to the release of supernatural power. Understanding your divine nature. Understanding your divine nature. We spend a lot of time with our, uh, our covering, our physical self, we don't spend enough time getting to know the divine nature. You are divine in nature. Lord have mercy. Say that. I am divine in nature. So what happens is this will give you the confidence you need to operate like God in the affairs of life. Uh-oh. -uh. I ain't God. Ain't nobody said you was God. Everybody, everybody in here know you ain't God. But understanding sonship is the key to operating in the supernatural. Understanding sonship, that's where it starts right there. It's the key to operating in the supernatural. Now, there are a lot of weird things getting ready to happen. People more submitted to demonic forces, just weird spiritual things. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm making sure my supernatural is good to go, charged up. I, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready. Weird stuff, stuff I ain't never seen before, stuff shit. It don't make no difference. I'm a son of God. Amen. This, is why I'm, this is why I'm telling you this. So whatever you may confront between now and Jesus coming back, tonight's objective is to let you know not to act like mere mortals. You are a son of God yes. equipped to move in the supernatural. So whatever the devil want to bring, whatever he want to say, whatever he want to move, you messing with a son of God. And you got to know you a son of God. I got to calm down. I got to calm down. All right, so you, 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 you're a son of God. So we're talking about the divine. The, the divine. The divine. I, I was, um, uh, yeah, anyway. The divine. The divine. The son of God. Understanding your sonship 
is the key to operating in the supernatural. Now, if, if we'd have just skipped this and we would just read, you know, they that receive him to them gave he the privilege to become sons of God. You're just thinking that, oh, well, I'm just a son of God. Isn't that sweet? I'm just, I'm, I'm chilling a God. I'm just, a, this is so much more than that. This is so much more than that. Understanding your sonship is the key to operating in the supernatural. We live in a kingdom of choices, not chances. Your lot in life is determined by your choice, not by chance. And tonight, I want to motivate you to make a choice to understand sonship. Because once you make that choice, ain't no devil going to, what, what, what you running from? What you, when you know who you are, wow. See, here's the thing that got me. They know who we are. But they got to keep you from knowing who you are. I said I wasn't going to holler tonight. They got to keep you from knowing who you are. And I'm getting ready to show you who you are. Amen. Excuse me, English. Is you ready for this tonight? I'm ready. <laughs> All right, let's go to work. Let's go to work. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Uh, it, just in the King James. The idea of being a son versus being a servant. Most people today see themselves as servants of God and not sons of God. Okay. Uh, the idea of being a son versus being a servant in our relationship with the Lord under, under this new covenant, this thing is, is woven throughout Paul's writing. And here in Hebrews 3, in verse 5 and 6, he says, And Moses verily was, uh, and Moses was, ver and Moses verily was faithful in all his house. Moses was faithful as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken afterwards. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we? Y'all, there, there's several opportunities to, to explode here tonight. And then, you know, I wore my, my comfortable slipper shoes tonight because I, I might have to do a little running here tonight. You understand? Stretched out and everything. You understand? If we hold fast, what? The confidence and the rejoicing of hope that's firm unto the end. So tonight's teaching is to try to get you confident about who you really are. Moses was a servant, and those who were under the law were servants. Follow me now. Moses was a servant, and those who were under the law were servants. Christ is the Son, and those who are in Christ are sons of God. Amen. How many of you are in Christ? Hallelujah. You're sons of God. You're, you're, not, you're not servants of God. In Christ, you're not a servant no more. Amen. Under the law, you were servants. With Moses, you were servants. But the Bible says you are no long, longer under the law. You're under grace, which means you're no longer a servant. You are sons. Oh, my goodness. Now, once we understand the meaning of sonship, we will walk in the love. We'll walk in the authority of the Father. Once we understand the meaning of sonship, his mission, his vision, and, and, and heart will, will become our very own. Now, we are no longer under the old covenant system where we are dependent on a priest to represent us before God or a prophet to give us a word. Now, I know some religions still have you going to a priest in a closet to talk to him, and then he'll talk to God for you. I ain't talking about nobody. <laughs> but the only closet I'm going in is my closet. <laughs> so I can talk to the Lord for myself because sons don't have to deliver their prayer through somebody. Sons have access to their father. You don't hear me. Yeah. 
We have our own personal, intimate relationship as a son and daughter with our father. Now, let's, let's go back here. In the New Testament, the new covenant of grace, the first thing we need to know as sons of God is that our father will never, ever break his covenant with us. I'm a son of God, the covenant of grace, sealed. Never going to break it. So once we know that, we're going to walk as sons and find it easy to serve one another in humility because we understand that we are sons of God, not servants. Now, come on. Y'all know y'all have heard that in the church in this day and time. I'm a servant of the Lord. I hear what you're trying to say. But in light of what's getting ready to happen on the earth, I need you to get focused on your sonship. I need you to wake up every morning feeling more than just a mortal man. I need that abasha. I need to, I need to calm down. What I, what, I, what I need to do? I need to calm down. I, something is getting ready to happen. Let, let, me, let me show you this. Let me show you this. Romans 8, 19. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the whole creature, the whole creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What they waiting for? Sound like they waiting on us to show up to handle some stuff. Creation is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. And I'm telling you, the sons of God are here. They, have, they just don't have no confidence in, in their sonship. So it's like they got power that they're not aware of. And they're going through all these weird religious things to try to see something happen, and you're a son. My kids, even today, they grown. But when they, especially when they were small, I don't care if I had the president of the United States in my office. They walk right in there. Dad, I'm hungry. They could do that. Because I'm their father. You are the sons of God. You don't supposed to be acting like a servant to your daddy. All right, watch this. Let's take it a little deeper. Let me go back to John 1, 12 again. You know what it says there that receive him. God gives power or the right and privilege to become sons of God. How? By believing in his name, by receiving him, by depending on him. Now, until one, until, until you, until, until, until all of us mature in, into a son. So now we, now we know where our maturity is leading. If something happens when we mature into a son, uh, it, until you mature into a son, you are excluded from handling certain responsibilities. Until you come into your sonship and recognize your sonship, you will be excluded from certain responsibilities. Yesterday, I, I pulled this movie up, Hercules. I don't know, I just felt like Hercules. And uh, he was strong, but he couldn't, he couldn't tap into the supernatural until he accepted that he was the son of Zeus. And until he accepted, I am the son of Zeus. When he accepted he was the son of Zeus, supernatural stuff started happening. Boy, that lightning came down, hit him. He had supernatural power like he ain't never had before. And I said, isn't that something? Right here in this movie. He was excluded from certain things until he matured in his sonship. Wonder what's being held back from you because you won't accept your sonship. You keep walking around like you're just an ordinary, regular mortal. And you're looking, listening to me right now. Well, what, what, what other kind of mortal is there? 
There is a sonship mortality that brings you into the supernatural and the super gets on your mortality and you're not going to be like everybody else. You're not running from no demons. You're not running from and fearing what somebody said going to happen. You're like, bring it on. I'm a son. I'm a son of God. Don't let me go to my daddy. All right, now let's, 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 let's dig a little deeper. Galatians chapter 3. All right, let's, let's dig a little deeper here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. And I think we're going to find a lot of answers in this. This is, uh, this is big. This is big. And, and, and I knew I had to cover this before I go on in John because so many people just skip that phrase uh, about the Son of God. Galatians 3, 27. All right, let's look at 27 through 29. Just now watch this. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So my faith in Christ Jesus makes me a, a child of God. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you be, be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, singular, and here's the part I want you to get, heirs according to the promise. Some I say, I'm an heir. I'm an heir. An heir. Now, I want to compare and contrast what it means to be an heir versus what it means to be an heir apparent. An heir apparent like King Charles was for so long. You wondered if that boy was ever going to be King Charles. I mean, is Queen Elizabeth ever going to leave? Okay, so an heir, an heir, in, what's the difference? An heir inherits right now. An heir apparent one day will inherit. An heir is not going to inherit one day. So when he says you're an heir, that means you inherit right when you became an heir. Not one day. Back up. Look at Galatians 4, verse 1 through 3. Galatians 4, 1 through 3. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, different nothing from a servant. Oh, wow. So an immature heir is on the same level as a servant. Different none from a servant. Though he be, he's the Lord of all, but we don't see the sonship and his inheritance because he still, he won't mature. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So basically this is representing the law. So somebody under the law and trying to live by the law and their performance, they're servants. They're in the realm of, of a servant. Three. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. If we had time to study it out, you would see all of that is referring to the law. So a child is unable to inherit. A mature son is ready to inherit. Full mature son versus a baby, an infant, a minor. All right, now, so listen to this. Write this down, never forget it. The law is for children. Grace is for sons. <laughs> Think on that for a moment. The law is for children. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to live by the law of Moses. Okay, child. The law is for children. I, I, I get it now. I, I, I sit there and I look at folks fight the gospel and they want to live by the law. They act like children. They're not ready to inherit anything. The law is for children. But grace is for mature sons. Glory be to God. All right, now let's go a little deeper here now. This gets a little interesting. Let's look at this adoption piece. Galatians chapter 4. 
Let's go four through five, he says. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now, why was Jesus made under the law? Verse 5, to redeem or to deliver them that were under the law. So Jesus said, I came under the law so I could fulfill the law, so I can deliver those who are under the law. I want to deliver those who, did you see this? To redeem them that were under the law. If, if Jesus wanted you to live by the law, why does it say he came to deliver or redeem you who are under the law? Because he knows as long as you're under the law, you will never be ready for your sonship. Because the law is for children. But he came to redeem you that were under the law. Why? That we might receive. I got to get you out from under the law so you can receive the adoption of sons. Now, this adoption is not like the natural adoption. We got to be careful sometimes. You know, we got to remember God is not a man. So you can't compare everything that happens with humans to God. Because this is definitely not like, like, like that, that situation. Um, in fact, this word adoption in verse 5, in, the, in the, the Greek, it's translated adult son placing. Think, think about that. Adult son placing. So when he adopted you, <laughs> he, I'm not talking about uh, someone else's child with the DNA different from the adopted parents. But we are actually born of God as new creation with God's very own spiritual DNA. Amen. So when God adopted us, it's not like you can tell, you know, like in natural adoptions, you can go get a blood test and tell that's not your, your, your child because they have a different DNA. But God says, when I adopt you, I don't adopt you with a different DNA. I get involved in adult placement, which means when I adopt you, you got the same DNA that I have, you have the same DNA that Jesus has. I'm not adopting you, and you, you, you maintain just somebody else's DNA. You mine. You mind how your parents used to say, that's my child. Now, you got to get a hold of that right there. This, that's, to me, I mean, when he uses this word adopt, receive the adoption of son, or adult son placing. He is saying, uh, I adopted you, and I took away somebody else's DNA. And you got my DNA. That's powerful. But without any confidence in that, you're not receiving your sonship. If you're waking up questioning whether or not God still love you, you're a child. Sons don't get up like that. Sons get up like, let me go in here and talk to my dad. Hey, dad. All right, now watch this. Galatians, now let's look at verse 6 now. And because you are sons, look at there. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart. So now you have the spirit that God's sons have. In the Old Testament, they didn't have that spirit dwelling on the inside of them. In this new covenant of grace, you have the spirit of the Son of God in your heart, and that spirit on the inside of you is sent to confirm who you are he is crying from within, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit himself cries out of our heart. He's crying out of our heart, Daddy. The presence of the Spirit of God inside you 
proves that we are the sons and daughters of God. You still ain't got it. Let me go to another person. Don't give me a little uh, amen. You still ain't got what I'm saying. Look at Romans chapter 8. I know when you get something, when you don't, you ain't got it. You ready, you ready to walk out of here like a normal mortal. And I'm trying to get you to fly out of here. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 14, 16. This will help. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. How many of you are led by the Spirit of God? How many of you are led by the law? That's the difference. See, when you're led by the Spirit of God, he says, you're sons of God. You're sons of God. Because the Holy Spirit is the administrator of this new covenant. As many as are led by the by Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Ghost has been sent to constantly try to get you convinced. You're sons of God. You're children of God. You're sons of God. You're children of God. You're not just a Christian. You're sons. Some of y'all getting it. I'm a member of World Changers. You're not just a member of World Changers. You are a son in the family of the Almighty God with the same DNA that he has. Okay, so the spirit of sonship brings with it a sense that we are right with God. I'm a son. I'm right with God. I remind myself of two things. I'm, I'm the righteousness of God, and I'm a son of God. Those two, they, they go together. They confirm one another. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm a son of God. But we stick with righteousness more than son. The spirit of a slave brings with it the sense that we need to perform to earn the right to be in God's presence. That's under the law. That's the spirit of, of a slave. That's the spirit of a servant. I got to perform because I got to earn the right to open up the refrigerator in my house. That's the spirit of slavery. But a spirit of the son just go in, in the kitchen and open the refrigerator up. And get anything in the refrigerator, even if it's daddy's pie, that he'd been looking forward to eating all day long. Came in, took a shower, put his pajamas on, got it, everything ready to go. Walked in there and somebody ate the pot. The only difference between that dad and your daddy, he ain't getting as mad as you got because, you know. A spirit of a servant feels the need to operate by the law and perform. The spirit of a servant falls from grace. Under the law, God was a judge. Under grace, God is a father. So as sons, we don't need to fear judgment from God. While we're there, look at verse 15. You hear what I just said? As a son, we don't need to fear judgment from God. Romans 8, 15 says, For you have not the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So as sons, we don't need to fear judgment from God. You remember when you were growing up, you did something wrong, you was afraid, boy, my daddy gonna whoop me. Oh, when daddy get home, daddy gonna whoop me because I broke the law. He gonna whoop me. No, no, I don't carry those fears anymore. Not a relationship, this relationship we have is not a relationship based in fear but in the privilege and the freedom to call him daddy. The privilege and the freedom to call him daddy. Some of y'all need to go and fix your prayers up. You're going, to, you're going to your daddy too formally. Yeah, you are. You're not talking to him like you know him, like you some kin to him. Oh, most gracious majesty that sits upon the throne. We, your humble servants, <laughs> come to you right now, asking in the most humblest way that we know how, if you could just stop by just a little while, 
then we know that everything will be all right. And he up there like, I'm your daddy, baby. I'm your daddy. Just talk to me. Just talk to me. I, I tell you, I, I am so enjoying my relationship with the Lord. I, um, I don't know what day it was, but I woke up and I said, oh, thank you so much for, that was a good sleep. That was just awesome. And he reminded me some stuff. He said, hey, yeah, remember, I want you to teach on falling from grace before you go to, go to inferiority. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, you, you told me that. Yeah, I got it. He said another thing. Yesterday when you did that, that taping, you, you, you forgot a piece of it. You need to go back. I said, I sure did. I said, thank you, Lord. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be. Last night, I, I'd, I'd just been bothered. And I asked the Lord, I said, just help me, Lord. Let me just have peace. It was as if my father put me in a Ziploc bag of peace. <laughs> I dreamed about peace. I smelled peace. I was feeling peace. I got up this morning, I said, Lord, why so much peace? <laughs> I'm like, God, dog, this is peace. Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, the, some of the damage that was left behind, it was really irritating one night. And, and most people would think, well, he won't do that. And I put my hands on it, and I, I was like, oh, God, please take this away from me now. No sooner than I said, ow, it was gone. And I went on sleep. But that's a father. He says, you will not ask of him bread or fish, and he give you stone. But we, we don't receive as father because we don't receive ourselves as adopted sons. Let me show you what this is about. Our sonship comes in three stages. Listen to me carefully. Number one, it's our sense of identity. My sonship comes as a sense of my identity. Number two, my sonship comes as a sense of my acceptance. And number three, my sonship comes as a sense of my approval. Now, I want to show you all of this in, in one scripture. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. I think I read from the NIV. These three bring a true sense of belonging, identity, acceptance, approval. These are basic human needs, and only God can give us a true and lasting sense of belonging. Nobody else will be able to give you that sense of belonging. People under the performance-based system of this world, they don't walk in the inheritance, and the heritage is sons of God. They don't walk in these three basic human needs from grace. And so today, people, they gain their identity by their money, by their appearance, their education, their achievements, even their ministries. Being driven by these things is a sign of religion because the law makes people insecure, always aspiring to become instead of resting in who they are. With that in mind, and a voice from heaven said, look what he said. Number one, this is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Did you see that? This is my son, my son, that's identity. And whom I'm well pleased, or whom I love, that's acceptance. with whom I am well pleased, that's approval. Right there, Jesus received identity, acceptance, and approval, because that's what sons receive. And tonight I want you to receive identity, you're God's son, acceptance, he loves you, and approval, 
he is well pleased with you. Look at Ephesians 1 and 6. Ephesians 1 and 6. My goodness. He says, to praise, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. As a son, you're accepted. As a son, he approves you. He wants you to accept your identity. I'm a son. Listen to this. I got about five minutes. We get our identity, we get our acceptance, we get our approval from being in Christ. Amen. Okay? Not, not what I do on my own. I'm in Christ. So as Jesus is, what does Scripture say? So are we, all right? As much as he is loved and accepted and approved, so are we. We are loved, accepted, and approved. Now, all of this is going to set you up next Wednesday or next time we get together. I'm a, we're going to continue with Galatians chapter 4, and you're going to read about the two sons, one that was born from Hagar, Ishmael, and one that was born from Sarah, one that was born from self-effort, and, and one that was born from the supernatural. You are not children of self-effort. You are children of the supernatural. Amen. I said you're children of the supernatural. Yeah. Ooh, I so want to get in that tonight. You're children of the supernatural. You're not children of, of, of the bondwoman. You're children of the free. I better leave that alone. That, that thing, look, you, you know, you, you study it out. Um, and as soon as the day that Ishmael was weaned, him and his mama got put out of the house. Yeah. I think it's time for you to put the law out of the house. You need to get weaned from it Amen. because you're children of the supernatural. Amen. All right, now, before I close, I want you to think about what we talked about here. Accepting and having confidence in your sonship. So what's the creation waiting on? Confident sons in God of the covenant of grace. That's what he's waiting on. People who know who they are at the start of attack, in the middle of an attack, and at the end of an attack. Amen. That you went through the whole thing not denying your sonship. Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So now, I'm not just teaching this so you can go and ooh, ah, <laughs> and every now and then jokingly say, I'm a son of God. Yes. I need you to engage everything that's attached to this sonship. And what's attached to this sonship is super natural livelihood. Mortals can't figure out how to get this or move that or stay peaceful in the middle of an attack. And you got to quit fabulizing everything, too. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm the son of God in the supernatural. Car, come. Come on, come on. That's little. That's least. No, that's little. That's least. We're talking about fighting against these spiritual forces that are trying to take you down, take you out, and convince you that you are not a son of God. 
we, we, we got this, this, this fable thing, you know. The only thing you can think to use your faith for is a material thing. That is the least in the kingdom of God. There's a huge battle going on in the realm of the spirit, and it's designed to kill, steal, and destroy. I mean, let me give you an example. The scripture says, Jesus says, I have not, he says, I, I, um, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. When we forget about the whole context, we just, we want to, we don't, we want to apply it to some fable thing. What he's talking about is when Satan showed up in the Garden of Eden, he came to kill, steal, and destroy. When Jesus showed up on the planet, he says, I came to give you life out of all of that death and all of that destruction. And I'm going to give you life in abundance to the full and to it overflows. He says, there's nobody that can take life out of death but him. And how you convert that to your prosperity freaks me out. Okay, eventually it may, it may get down there, but that's the first thought you have. That's the first thought you have. God, uh, uh, Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. You're not taking my money. You're not going to take my car. You're not going to take my promotion. But I have come that you might have life and have it. See there, abundant life. God wants me to live rich, and he wants me. To, yeah, I'm not denying that God can bless you in the material realm. I'm not denying it. But is that the, is that the first context? <laughs> and you miss out on the bigger? Amen. Something that's so much bigger than your little car that you could have got if you have just had a budget? <laughs> So we want to reduce scripture down to playing these little games, and that's why folks can't rock with it because it, 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 it's, 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 it's teaching the, uh, the, you're taking the text out of the context and you're leaving people with the con and, and eventually folks don't realize that and it's like, okay, isn't this deeper than that? That didn't have a deeper meaning? Yeah. Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy everything God wanted to happen. But Jesus showed up and said, even though you came and you brought death and you brought destruction, I have come to take life out of everything that you thought you messed up. And I can show you I can take water out of a rock, praise God, and I can take life out of death. And then eventually you'll get to it, and I can take prosperity out of poverty. I'm walking in my sonship right now. R-A-T, quick as a rat. I, I am a son of God. I'm executing like a son of God. I, that's how I move, like a son of God. I got a father up there that doesn't require me to always approach him with the religious protocol. He my daddy. And while I might not say it all right and I might not enter into his courts correctly, I, why is it that the church, the first thing they want to do is start pushing rules at people? Yeah. Well, you need to pray, but you don't know how to pray, so you need to go through these five classes so you'll know how to pray. <laughs> well, he my dad, so I, can I just talk to him? <laughs> and you know what I do? I go to him and say, hey, dad, I don't know how to pray. Teach me how to do this. And then his presence come over you so heavy, you can't hardly say nothing. And, and you just laying there listening to him, and he talking to you. And the first thing he wants to show you is that prayer is not a monologue where you do all the talking. Prayer is a dialogue where you talk a little bit, and I talk back to you a little bit, and you talk a little bit, and then I start talking, and you like what I'm saying, you just don't want to say nothing no more. Prayer is a relationship. It's a communion. I guess y'all can tell I'm so free, it don't even make no sense, man. I can remember a time when I would preach stuff like this, and I realized it's going out to the public. I'm like, oh, God, they're going to get me, and then hesitating, and then, well, I better not say that. Man, I don't even know what that dude is. I'm a son. I'm a son. I'm a son. And the, and the kingdom belonged to my dad. And he's delivered me from servanthood. He's delivered me from slavery. Amen. 
and he's brought me into this marvelous light, the word that's wrapped up in flesh to deliver unto me a precious grace gift that no one qualified to deliver except the one who was full of it. Thank God for the gospel. Amen. Thank God for the gospel. So, if you remind me, we'll, we, we, we got a, a plenty more to go to, but I, I, that's an introduction to, to, the, to sonship. Study out on your own. Your sonship is, is it's, people are waiting on it. Creation's expecting it. They're ready to to bow down to the sons of God. Amen. <laughs> this is so cool, boy. Amen. I am a son of God. So come what may, we will no longer walk like ordinary, immortal beings.